Um, but tonight I just want to talk about science and skepticism. In science, we search for natural explanations for natural phenomena uh, and always ask the what's more likely question that aliens traversed the vast distances of interstellar space and landed in Farmer Bob Field in Pucker Brush, Kansas and made a crop circle that says skeptic.com as a way of promoting our webpage, or, or that somebody with Photoshop made a nice little slide for me to throw up there for you. Uh, so obviously the question kind of answers itself, but really that's what we're doing always in science is what's the more likely explanation for this mystery. Um, we can ask it this way before we say something is out of this world, let's first make sure it is not in this world. Once again, we can ask the more likely question, what's more likely that aliens traverse the vast distances of interstellar space and landed in Sacramento, California, to help the governor in his bid for the governorship? Uh, or that the uh, World Weekly News just makes stuff up. <laughs> well, we have no actual experience of aliens landing anywhere. We have lots of experience of tabloid magazines and newspapers making things up. Uh, by the way, we've always tracked the sort of iconography of what aliens look like. They change over the decades depending on popular films and so on. This is the first alien I've seen with a buff body build. <laughs> He's on the Arnold Wirkash program. <laughs> Uh, and yet another way to say it is in my favorite cartoon from Sidney Harris here, uh, uh, who says a dead miracle occurs on the chalkboard. He says, I think you need to be more explicit here in step two. Um, it's not that uh, miracles are not allowed in science because there's nobody allowing or disallowing anything in science, not a dictatorship, right? It's just, what can you do with the concept of the miracle? It's just, by de definition, it's something, a violation of natural law, it's something that's out of space and time, it's an interruption of nature, it's supernature or supernatural, and, uh, and science just deals with the natural. So in a way, there's nothing to do with that. And that, that's the problem ultimately with intelligent design theory. That's a whole other lecture that I won't get into tonight, but basically I can summarize the entire one hour lecture in one slide, here it is, this is how intelligent design theory goes. Every, every argument you've ever heard or ever will hear sounds like this, X looks designed. I can't think of how X was designed naturally, therefore X was designed supernaturally, the god of the gaps argument we call it. Well, just because you can't think of how it came about naturally, uh, maybe you ought to just roll up your sleeves and get to work and see if you can figure it out. Maybe if you can't figure it out, maybe somebody else will. But ultimately, uh, calling on the supernatural is no different than calling on a miracle. In other words, you need to be a little more explicit there in step two, uh, I think. And uh, so anyway, that's a whole other different subject. I wrote a book about that, and uh, this is my first book uh, I've ever published with full frontal nudity on the cover. So, uh, you can get away with that even in America if it's a different species. <laughs> of course, if you're a creationist, it's not a bother because we have no relationship to those guys, right? Like this here for the last time. <laughs> So let's look at a case study here. But basically, this talk is in three parts, sort of light and fun, and a little heavy, and then light and fun. So uh, let's start off with something kind of light and fun. Are UFOs coming to Earth or are humans being abducted by aliens? I want to believe, you recognize the poster from Fox Mulder's uh, 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 X-Files office there. So again, let's just ask that what's more likely question. Do UFOs represent spacecraft from other worlds? Or do they represent anomalies from this world? Uh, well, first of all, it's just an unidentified flying object. Uh, it doesn't mean it's extraterrestrial. It just means, like the God of the Gaps argument, you, you can't figure it out what it is. The fact that you can't figure it out doesn't mean it's extraterrestrial. So, for example, here is a UFO. This is uh, a picture taken from my house in Altadena, California, overlooking Pasadena. Downtown LA is right here. That's my bush right there on the edge of my cliff. And if that, if that UFO looks like a Buick hubcap, that's because that's what it is. Uh, this was for a TV show uh, that we filmed uh, a few years ago um, in which I had my daughter and a few of her friends with some little uh, throwaway and schematic uh, cameras snapping some pictures of UFOs that we then submitted to a UFO um, a group and to also a photographic expert uh, to see if they could tell if it was fake or not. They couldn't. Uh, that's just uh, the old frisbee toss. You're just, you just stand off to the side, camera's ready, throw it over a sort of, sort of a cliff, focus on infinity to the city, stay below, and you've got it. You can do that with a, a paint, paint of glass. You can take some coins, put double-sided tape on the back, stick the coins to the glass in a nice sort of 
sort of like they're in flying in pattern of some kind of an arc or a triangle or something like that, and then you focus on infinity so that the coins are little blurs hovering over the cityscape, something like that. There's a bunch of different ways to fake UFO photos. Doesn't mean that they're all fake, of course not, but the idea that it's so easy to do, my daughter was eight when they did this, uh, it, it's, uh, it's possible that at least uh, some of them are uh, fake in that sense. Um, a more interesting question, I think, psychologically, uh, is this whole alien abduction phenomenon. That is, what's more likely, that alien abductions represent alien-human contact or some kind of human psychological phenomenon? This is from the uh, Travis Walton story. Um, Fire in the Sky was the name of his book and the film uh, based on that. Uh, and this is from a medieval uh, portrait of experiences people described having in the Middle Ages of incubi and succubi. Uh, here is, in fact, Henry Fusilli's The Nightmare from 1781. Several centuries ago, the English referred to nighttime sensations of chest pressure from witches or other supernatural beings as the mare, from the Anglo-Saxon mariner, to crush. So a nightmare was the crusher who comes in the night. Uh, and so instead of describing the experience as uh, extraterrestrial, of course, they described them as uh, incubi and succubi. These were demons because they lived in a demon haunted world. We live in an alien haunted world. So, in, in essence, we think it's something called sleep paralysis. The best data set on this is by Alan Shane from the University of Waterloo. He has over 28,000 cases. Symptoms include paralysis. This is why you're asleep. You know, a sense of paralysis, a sense of pressure on the chest, presence of a bean in a room says a floating, flying, or falling, or leaving one's body. We've all had this experience a little bit, right? The, the uh, dreams of floating or, or flying. And, and the reason for that is because you're in a supine position on your comfy bed, super relaxed with your muscles relaxed, and your little narrative storytelling in your brain is trying to make sense of the stimuli coming in of that super relaxed, supine position. And so you feel like you're floating or, or falling. So this is an addition to that. Uh, Sometimes there's a, a sense of terror, excitement, exhilaration. Usually happens during EEG or REM sleep or dreaming sleep, so it's a type of dream. Um, the sense presence is what I'm after here. Uh, the, uh, a, a being in the room. There's somebody else in here with me. Who is that? So the brain can't, it, it, it can't perceive itself as being that self. There's only one me. So there can't be two me in here. There has to be a me in here and a somebody else out there. And so what you call that somebody else out there is your culture tells you what to call it. It's a demon, it's a ghost, it's a poltergeist, it's an alien. It's whatever is popular in pop culture. Um, so that's what we think is, is going on there. In fact, we, we believe now that the brain is the, the seat of all experience. That is seen as believing, but believing is also seen and hearing, tasting, smelling, and touching. Um, uh, we, we know, I mean, there's great debates in cognitive science and philosophy about consciousness and is there something else besides the brain? Is there something called the mind? <coughs> well, anyway, I'll just give you my opinion on this. I, uh, I, I'm probably still in the mind, minority position on this, even among scientists. Uh, but I think there's just brain. That the mind is just a word to describe what the brain does. And I think the best argument for our position is that if you cut out a part of the brain, whatever it was doing, it's not doing it anymore. It's gone forever. Unless you're really young when you ding the brain and some other part of the brain takes over, but that's the point. There's some, there has to be some neural tissue doing the function. The stuff we call mind is intimately, inexorably linked to the stuff we call brain. There's no mind, there's just brain. So therefore, when you're gone, well, that's it. <laughs> there, unless you can think of some other way to download your memories and your personality onto some other platform, <laughs> computer chips or something that lasts a lot longer than electric meat of our brain tissue, um, that's it. So it's all right there. It's in the three pounds of, of a goo between your ears. Uh, and uh, anyway, that's the best argument for that. Uh, uh, not everybody agrees with me on that. Uh, there are still some people that are really into quantum physics that think that somehow the quantum super, super weird, spooky action at a distance means that somehow my thoughts get carried on into the future. Uh, but I'm skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the phantom limb phenomenon is another example. Let me, let me uh, 
stop. I'm going to show you one. Uh, I've got a ser series of vid short video clips here. This is from, this one's about six minutes long. This is from a, um, a TV show that I had 